The Steve Gill Show. Hey, welcome back in. This is the Steve Gill Show. Glad to have you with us. He was the uh, the candidate who made the Iowa caucuses matter. President Jimmy Carter with us. Uh, a, a president who had to deal with issues that modern presidents just don't have to deal with. Disasters that, as, as bad as things are, he had to deal with really tough things. Like, well, leisure suits, plaid polyester pants powder blue tuxes ties that looked about six inches wide uh seriously mr president for all the issues that people have to deal with today nobody had to deal with the fashion issues of the 70s no i I'm, I'm, uh, i had some sons to help me get through that era. i was uh in high school and college at that time i look back at some of the pictures of not only your staff but also those of us in that time what were we thinking and and they can't blame you for any of that that, that is uh, is unfair uh, author of a new book by the way through the year with jimmy carter 366 daily meditations from the 39th president we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment but you know the, the morning after the iowa caucuses nobody cared about iowa till you went to iowa in 1976 and made the iowa caucuses matter well that's true well our caucuses matter a lot because they weed out some folks but then i went on and won in new hampshire and then the next test was in florida and i won all three of those first uh, ones by coming in first place, and uh, after that, it was basically over. I had it won. There was a shorter. There's now a shorter period of time between the Iowa caucuses. You've got New Hampshire now in one week. You actually had more time, as I recall, back in 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 your day, to actually build from that Iowa caucus surprise victory to to stay in the political limelight and actually build from it. It is so quick now when you've got to go to the next one, to the next one, to the next one that it, you really don't even get the benefits. Well, that's true, and, and I, but I had done a lot of work the previous year in New Hampshire as well, and my biggest test was in Florida because, as you as you may be old enough to remember, George Wallace was a formidable factor in Florida and was expected to win overwhelmingly. But when I beat Wallace in Florida and also won the first two, then uh, the rest of the thing was not coasting, but it was um, pretty well clear who was going to win. Primaries are always a, a brutal process. You you ended up having to deal with a primary challenge from Ted Kennedy when you were running for re-election, and, and it's always hard to pull people term, back. That's what all these candidates are now having to face. I mean, we saw a brutal primary four years ago with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. They were able to patch things together. We're seeing some pretty vicious stuff already going between the Republican candidates this time. How do you come back together after that? Well, of course, we didn't have a chance to come together because uh, Kennedy's opposition to me, he won enough uh, Democratic votes to split the Democratic Party. And, and Reagan won 51% of the votes after the Democratic Party split. And so we didn't ever have a chance to come back together. But uh, Ted Kennedy and I remained friends the rest of his life. And they got along fairly well, even though uh, he was responsible, I think, for putting Reagan in the White House. When you look at uh, this president, you've offered up some advice that if you want to get a second term, you don't want to alienate the voters in the first term. It's almost too late for him to do anything about that. Well, he's been very careful, I think, not to alienate voters, and I think he's going to be reelected next year. Even with the economy, I mean, you, you were a president that suffered because of a dire economy. He's really got a worse economy than you had to contend with. Well, that that may be true, but I also had, uh, as, as I just mentioned, a split Democratic Party, and also that uh, hostages were being held in Iran. So those were the major factors. It wasn't the economy, the number one issue. You know, it's, it's interesting that when we look 30 years later, you know, the Middle East is, is as hot a spot as it's ever been. I mean, one of the great accomplishments of, of your presidency was the Middle East peace process, and yet it seems like there is never peace in that region. Are you hopeful that someday, somehow, real peace will emerge in that region. Someday, somehow, but we're going to have to have strong leadership in the White House, which we don't have at this point, as you know. I would guess that the United States' uh, influence throughout the Middle East is now at the, at the lowest level since Israel was formed more than 60 years ago. You point out that this administration hasn't, hasn't been particularly strong in getting anything done there. What should President Obama do to, to get back on the right track there? Well, they should stick with what he said at the beginning, no more settlements, and also the 1967 borders, with some modifications, should be the binding uh, factor in the negotiations. But he's backed away from both of those, I think, under pressure from you know, elements in the United States. So he's being careful not to alienate people in order to get reelected next year. You have the, the, the peace process that's always hampered by those who really do want to see Israel, it appears, wiped off the map. 
Uh, again, again, you had uh, Golda Meir, who was president of Israel at one point, say, we're never going to have peace as long as they hate the Jews more than they love their own children. That seems to be still a failing point in the region. There, there does seem to be this hatred and determination to wipe Israel off the map. And I don't know how we get around that. Well, most of the Palestinians, whom I know quite well, uh, are quite willing to accept Israel in its, in its normal in, internationally recognized borders. But the fact is that Israel is occupying now almost all of the West Bank. And, uh, of course, that's going to have to be resolved as a major issue. One of the reasons that, that the Middle East is important is obviously because of the energy, the, the oil resources there. Um, when you look at that region as it becomes, you know, the Arab Spring, as you see more and more of these countries, they are moving from a, quote, moderate, uh, you know, even dictatorial leadership to a less moderate uh, Islamized uh, uh, control. Again, what we're seeing in Egypt, what we're seeing even in, in places like Turkey. Do you have hope that a, that a moderate Islam will emerge in that region? Well, yes, yeah, there is a moderate Islam. And in, in I think I'll be in Egypt next week, as a matter of fact. The court of is monitoring the election there. There's no doubt that, they, that the Islamic Brotherhood will be uh, prevailing in the parliament. And they have indicated... Uh, you know, pledge that they will maintain a moderate position, including uh, recognizing the integrity of the peace treaty that I negotiated between Israel and Egypt. And yet they're saying they won't recognize Israel itself. No, they haven't said that at all. As a matter of fact, the majority of the Palestinians have been perfectly willing to recognize Israel. In fact, uh, Abu Hamas uh, last week, uh, as a matter of fact, two days ago, was negotiating with Netanyahu, the prime minister of, uh, of Israel. Talk a little bit about this this new book. I mean, you've written in the past um, a, a lot about the political process, a lot about policy issues. This is really more kind of a personal meditation, a personal devotional. It's a little bit of a, of a twist from what you've done in the past. Well, I've written a couple of other religious books. This is a collection of, uh, of my Sunday school lessons, uh, Bible lessons that I teach every Sunday in my uh, local church. We have a small church in a place called Maranatha, and I've taught about 650 uh, Sundays there, and this is a collection of 366 of the best Sunday school lessons, each one of which is about 45 minutes, but they are boiled down to one page each. And so it's a, it's a for people that are basically Christians. I happen to be a Baptist. Only about 15% of our visitors are Baptists. But we have anywhere from 100 to 800 visitors that come every Sunday to our little tiny church just to hear a politician you know, teach the Bible, which is a curiosity for many of them. Some of them never have been to church before, so so we it, this, these are lessons designed to for all Christians. In fact, we have a lot of of Jews and Muslims and Hindus and and uh, Buddhists also come to hear me teach. And we, it's a it's a it's a book that's designed for basic moral values, primarily Christian, but uh, applies to all religions. When you look at at our nation, a lot of folks see a, a nation where the, the morality, as you talk about it, is is much less than what what we enjoyed when when you were president back in the uh, the late seventies, uh, early eighties. How do you reverse a moral slide, a, a moral decline in a country that is as diverse and has as many different focal points as this country has now? Well, what America and all, all every individual person needs to do is to accommodate changing times, you know, with uh, modern Internet and that sort of thing, globalization, so-called, but still cling to cha- principles or moral values that, that don't change. And, and that's what I tried to outline in this book, is how these uh, basic lessons could apply to everybody's daily life and also apply even to a national uh, policy of moral values in, our, in, our, in the United States. One of the debates we've always had is you can't legislate morality, uh, and yet politicians have always tried to do that. Well, you know, I, when I was president, we had a strict separation between church and state, but that uh, barrier that Thomas Jefferson called a wall between church and state has basically been broken down with the, uh, I'd say, the right-wing uh, Republicans and the right-wing evangelicals forming an alliance that's lasted now for the last 25 years. But uh, that, that varies in, in its importance. I think we've seen uh, the evangelical uh, element split uh, yesterday in the election in, in uh, Iowa. So it's, it's not a binding thing, but it's one of the major factors that have changed in politics since I was in office. Do you also, though, see that the, the left-wing assault on Christianity as, as a problem as well, the drive it out of our society, drive it out of our culture? We can't even call Christmas trees Christmas trees in some places. Well, we, uh, I, 
I, I guess I would be called a, a you know a moderate or progressive, and uh, I believe sincerely in in Christmas and Jesus Christ and my own faith. Uh, we send out literally thousands of Christmas cards every every year. We always refer to the fact that Christmas uh, designates or commemorates the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. So I don't I don't think you could brand you know all the Democrats or all the liberals as anti-Christian, because I'm certainly not one of those. And yet when you look at the ACLU, they always seem quick to, uh, to try to drive Christian, uh, Christianity out of, our, out of our public squares when we're seeing Islam taught in our schools, increasingly embraced in a lot of our schools. So it does seem to be a, a bit of a double standard. Uh, the book is a great one, folks. I encourage you to pick it up. Through the Year with Jimmy Carter, 366 Daily Meditations. Former President uh, Jimmy Carter with us. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for being with us. Happy New Year to your wife and your family. We'll hopefully talk with you again soon. Well, thank you, Steve. It's been good to be with you and folks around Nashville and thank you guests all over the world. Thank you very much. We'll talk with you again. Happy New Year. We're back in a moment. This is The Steve Gill Show. 